Okay, the next part is causation. So we looked at methods. Now we have to look at a little bit about causation. Okay. Causation means that we argue that a certain event call or set a fact caused another. And that we believe that there are causes to things. Now, causes, it might be that I left my roller skates on the front step, caused my father to fall down the front step when I was a child because I, and I can say that act caused my father to fall down the stairs. Now, he could have uh, fallen down the step, my front, uh, my skate could have been on the step, but the part of the steps he stepped on and tripped over weren't the part of the steps that uh, my skate was on. Ah, oh. so he, his clumsiness let him fall down the steps. So that means in one case, in the first case, when I say he's tripped on my skate that I left on the front step and he fell down the steps, that's causation. Okay, I can link him stepping on my, my stray roller skate on the front steps, falling down those steps, okay, that's what caused his fall. However, in the second part of that example, it turns out that maybe that's not what happened. But I find out that my front skate was in fact on the front steps, my skate was on the front steps, but the part of the stairs that he stepped on was not anywhere near my, my front skate. He just lost his balance on his own. That is not causation. These are correlated, right? My front, my skate is on the front steps. He falls down the front steps. They are correlated. They're there. They're together. But one did not cause the other. And so correlation does not mean causation. So two things can appear together. And it is your job to determine, did one cause the other? So to examine facts and uh, uh, other parts of the situation to see if one causes the other. And that's an important part of uh, international relations. Does one act cause another, cause another, or cause another, or do they appear together and they're merely correlated? So these are important things to recognize in, in any policy or any multiple fields, but it's also in, in international relations. So for example, uh, we could say that the United States uh, increased its uh, tariff on imported goods in the 1920s and the Great Depression happened afterward. Are these events correlated? Well, yes, they're correlated. Does it mean one caused the other? That we need more information about. And so that's also an important part of international relations. So I like to stress it, keep it in mind. Now, we look at a few factors, exogenous, and endogenous, and process tracing. So the process of moving from correlation to causation to determine if one thing is not just correlated, it's a cause, is called process tracing. So understanding that. Uh, we examine exogenous factors. These are factors that lie, say, outside our theoretical model, as well as endogenous factors, which are factors which lie inside our theoretical model. So the example your book uses uh, is that democracy and war, right? Or democracy and no war. So do democracies cause no war or do no wars cause democracies? And what you need to do is find uh, they are correlated but does one cause the other and how? Finding that out is called process tracing and find that information that lie outside. So is it an external factor, which would be an exogenous factor that influences this, or an endogenous factor, does democracy cause no war? That would be inside. And finally, your book examines the role of history and counterfactual history. History is one of the most important tools that you can use in international relations. Um, 
even though a lot of international relations textbooks don't have a great deal of history in them, which I find to be quite interesting. Why do I make this statement? Well, one, because I'm a historian, and that's how I view things. Okay, but beyond that, there's another part uh, that I'd like to uh, convince you of. So it's difficult to process, trace uh, the causation or of any event. And so if you're also a rationalist and you believe that there's this chain of causation, it's hard to trace that chain uh, without a deep understanding of the process or of those events that led up to it. And the only way you will uh, get to adequately process trace to the modern era is through a thorough understanding of the past. So in that sense, it's helpful, uh, very helpful. And it also provides models of past moments and past decisions where people may have been in some in an analogous situation. Uh, and the choices they made and what we can learn from those choices. Uh, at its very root, a lot of what historians do is examine the choices people make or have made over time and also lay out for the audience or for the reader uh, or the person listening uh, the other choices available and maybe why those countries chose not to uh, do those things. Uh, this brings up another realm of history that professional historians mostly uh, shun, and that's called counterfactual history. But counterfactual history does have its uses, and what that simply means is that uh, you ask a what-if question. So this is actually a really popular fun thing uh, that people get involved in. That to them, this is one of the, the ways they interact with history the most. So they look at, uh, so for example, what if General Lee won the Battle of Gettysburg? You know, how would the Civil War have changed? And then you have to invent these new scenarios. Okay, historians deal with the record. They deal with what happened, not with what didn't happen. So to them, this is really a problem because then you have to put yourself into the mind of someone and try to trace things out. So part of the utility is, for example, one there's a number of popular books based on this very idea. General Robert E. Lee in the American Civil War, instead of losing the Battle of Gettysburg, wins. What happens next? Uh, does it change the outcome of the war? All these things. And while as a professional historian, there are, I have multiple problems with this activity from that sense, uh, as a history, because it's not a history anymore, but as an activity, it does require the person involved or in the reader to engage their critical mind and ask themselves about uh, why people make the decisions they make. And I think that's a useful exercise in any occasion and certainly something historians have to do when we talk about the options not taken. Uh, we should be able to posit some theory or some idea as to what might have happened. And I think I tend to be a, more of a rogue historian in that sense, but I guess because I think that's a useful activity. And there are more historians who do. So counterfactual history can be useful. I would also say that if that is, if you understand that to be sort of what history does, then you, then you're mistaken. But uh, it is a useful exercise, but regardless of counterfactuals, I think it's important it compels uh, the study of international relations compels us to examine what's happened in the past. Uh, if you're looking, whether you're a relativist or a constructivist, if you're a relativist, it's easier to label, to identify, and uh, look identify causes, but also it means that you can uh, process trace better, right? That's how you process traits. If you are a constructivist and you look at this connecting web, what history does is it provides a context for that web. So you can see the multiple connections between these different uh, factors. And you can, might even identify other, uh, other factors uh, that might be exogenous to that model.
So causation uh, is not, you know, correlation is not causation. Uh, correlation's a start. Then it's examining, is this a cause? If so, why? And then tracing it through.